In the last video, I told you we'd now turn to uh, benchmarking post hartree fock levels of theory in order to assess quality. But in order to do that, we need to pause for a moment and ask, how do you go about doing that benchmarking? All the ab initio calculations that we've done up till now have been on a single molecule in a vacuum. And mostly what we've focused on are energetics. That is, the binding energies of all of the electrons to all of the nuclei. So if I look at a particular uh, electronic energy that would be output if I do a calculation, I think I showed one for uh, helium that was minus two point something atomic units. So that is the amount of energy required to rip all the electrons off the molecule and separate all the nuclei and move them all to the edges of the universe so that they don't interact with one another. And it turns out that is a very difficult experiment to do in the laboratory, to take one molecule and look at how much energy you have to put into it in order to remove all its fundamental part, particles to the edge of the universe. In fact, what we'd much rather do is make a comparison to thermodynamic properties. And so what I'd like to do in this lecture is make the connection between the calculations we can do and thermodynamics. What allows us to compare calculations to experiment? And I've given this uh, lecture a subtitle, The Triumph of Statistical Mechanics, and in particular, The Ideal Gas Rigid Rotator Quantum Mechanical Harmonic Oscillator Approximation. And you'll see what all that means by the time we're at the end of the lecture. So how does an electronic energy relate to a thermodynamic quantity? Well, as I mentioned, electronic energies are unspeakably tiny energies and tiny, at some point you may have heard me say, an atomic unit is 627.5095 kilocalories per mole. And you probably thought to yourself, wow, that's a lot of energy. Yeah, but that was per mole. And so on a single molecule, you would need to divide by Avogadro's number, and you are talking about a very small amount of energy, which is the potential energy of all the particles interacting with one another at zero Kelvin. And I do have a little note here that it's classical nuclei, that is, we're treating the nucleus as a point charge, but that's not terribly important. But when we talk about chemistry, real chemistry, we've got an unspeakably large number of molecules, so, you know, maybe a mole's worth, and the distribution of energy is governed by Boltzmann statistics, at least if we're at equilibrium. So thermodynamic quantities actually describe ensemble properties of large numbers of molecules. And so if you like, if one molecule at zero Kelvin is kind of like a ball on a potential energy surface, I can change its geometry around, and that's like rolling it up or down the surface somewhere and describe its energy. Well, a mole of molecules not at zero degrees Kelvin is more like a flock of birds. And I've used this analogy before. They're bumping into each other. Some are rising in energy. Some are falling in energy as they do have these collisions. They thin in all directions from some central point, which is like a maxima in their uh, energy distribution, in a Boltzmann distribution. And it's a very chaotic system, but governed by a fairly simple uh, set of rules, and that's the, the Boltzmann distribution. So what are the fundamental equations of thermodynamics? I'm not going to teach a whole course in thermodynamics here, but uh, they all derive from an extremely important function in statistical thermodynamics. It's called the partition function, and it's written in various ways. I'm going to use Q. So usually with Q, you will specify certain state variables that you're holding constant. So for instance here, I've got the number of particles, the volume, and the temperature held constant. And the partition function is the sum over all possible states of the system, the exponential, negative the energy associated with that state, and the energy depends on the number of particles in the volume, divided by Boltzmann's constant times temperature. So that's actually a pretty simple looking equation. And various thermodynamic quantities can then be computed from the partition function. And so no derivation here, just presenting. The internal energy is kT squared times the partial derivative of the log of this with respect to T while holding N and V constant. The enthalpy is U plus pressure times volume. The entropy is also something that depends on the derivative of log Q. It also depends on log Q directly. And finally, the free energy, the Gibbs free energy in particular, is the enthalpy minus temperature times entropy. 
And I've just got a little note here. Uh, German speakers are, are much more sensible about defining this. They call this the free enthalpy. That's because it's H minus TS. The other free energy, you may recall, the Helmholtz free energy is defined as U minus TS, and U is indeed energy. And so and if you were a German speaker, you'd call that the Helmholtz free energy because U appears, and you call it the Gibbs free enthalpy because H appears. But okay, so that's my uh, plug for German speakers for today. But the bottom line is, were I to know Q, I would know all the thermodynamic state functions. So notice that in thermodynamics, the partition function, it's a lot like a wave function in quantum mechanics, right? It contains all the necessary information to get at the observables you're interested in, like enthalpy, entropy, free energy. But what's a good partition function? So here I just reproduced it for you. It looks so simple. All I need to know is all the energy states, uh, and I'm done. But gracious, how would I ever find all the possible energy states? So I got some arbitrary system of, you know, maybe Avogadro's number worth of molecules all interacting with one another and you know, it seems like there might be a lot of possible energy states. So it is a Brobdingnagian task to imagine assembling all possible values of E. So let's start making, simplifying approximations, and let's do it willy-nilly. So step one, assume my system is an ideal gas. And why would I do that? Well, the definition of an ideal gas is that the individual molecules do not interact with one another. So that means the total energy of the ideal gas is the sum of the individual energies. Okay, so now, ignore the lower equations for a moment, let me just focus on this very first line. Instead of having e to the minus some capital E, all I have to do is e to the minus the sum of all the individual E's for each of the molecules, molecule 1, molecule 2, all the way out to molecule n. And because my molecules are indistinguishable one from another, I'm going to need to divide by all the possible ways that I could take them and order them, and that's n factorial. So there's a 1 over n factorial out in front here, exponential sum of all the molecular energies. So that's the ideal gas approximation. Now, if I look at this, this is an exponential of a sum, and the exponential of a sum is equal to the product of exponentials. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to take this sum and I'm going to express it as 1 over n factorial, I'll run over all the energy levels for gas molecule 1, all the energy levels for gas molecule 2, and so on, until I have this, inf this uh, product of exponentials. But these are all the same molecule. This is an ideal gas of all the same molecules. And as a result, this is equal to this, is equal to this, is all the way out. So I have a single expression raised to the nth power and just to make my life a little easier, I'm going to stop running over all the possible energy states, and I'm actually going to run over energy levels. Some levels might be degenerate, so this is a degeneracy. So if I have two levels with the same energy, I'll just include them once, but I'll include this degeneracy factor. So this is starting to look a little bit simpler, because what, what really is inside the brackets at this stage, well... It's a partition function, but it's a partition function now just for a molecule. So the ideal gas approximation takes the partition function for the ensemble and expresses it as the partition function of the molecule. So I've used a little Q here instead of a capital Q, and I've just collected up terms. Well, now we can ask, uh, we need to run over those energy levels. So what contributes to the total energy of a molecule? Well, there's the electronic energy, and we've gotten that by solving uh, the Schrodinger equation, and when we do DFT, we'll get to the Cohn-Sham equations, so we know the electronic energy. There is translational energy, so at non-zero Kelvin, molecules are uh, translating through space, x, y, z directions. They have very dense levels which makes them look like a classical system. So what are those levels, by the way? You would usually find those from, say, a particle in a box solution, if it was quantum mechanics. But they're so dense, we can actually treat them as uh, looking like classical mechanics, unless we have extremely light molecules. There is rotational kinetic energy. So a rigid rotator, that's one of the 
problems we can actually solve exactly in quantum mechanics, if you recall. However, again, those levels tend to be extremely dense unless you have you know, molecular hydrogen or something. And as a result, we can again treat that like a classical system. And if you look in sort of uh, standard thermodynamics textbooks, you will find the contributions from translational and rotational energy to the partition function. There's the vibrational kinetic energy. And if we use a harmonic oscillator approximation to get at the vibrational levels, those levels are not dense. But it does turn out that the sum of the exponential over all the levels is actually convergent. The, the universe is a very friendly place sometimes. And all you need to know are the molecular vibrational frequencies in order to compute those sums. And there is, uh, I've got a little note here, that uh, the total kinetic energy from vibrations is not zero. It's zero Kelvin uh, for the quantum mechanical harmonic oscillator, and that's zero point energy. So you probably remember that there is vibration even in a perfect crystal at zero degrees Kelvin. Uh, and so uh, that's just uh, emphasizing the zero point vibrational energy. So what is it that we need in order to do a practical thermodynamics calculation, in order to assemble the entire partition function? Well, we need to know the molecular weight because that weight dictates the kinetic energy. We need to know the principal moments of inertia. And if we have a molecular geometry, then we know what the moments of inertia are. That's just, you know, how much do the atoms weigh and how far are they from the center of mass. And finally, we need to know the vibrational frequencies. So in order to get all of these components, we need to do a calculation, optimize the geometry, do a vibrational frequency calculation, and when we've completed that process, we will be able to form the partition function for the molecule. Last thing to do now is to set this all within the context of an experimental standard state convention. So let me sort of illustrate what we do with the calculations. Everything in this box up here would be done as a computation. So step one is compute the atoms and compute the molecule that these atoms make. So let's say it's methane. So here I'm going to compute methane, here I'm going to compute a carbon atom, and I'll take a hydrogen atom and multiply times 4. When I do that, I'll get an electronic energy. And maybe for CH4, uh, just because it's easier to draw, the energy goes up. It's up here. Now I add in zero-point vibrational energy for my molecule. Atoms don't have any vibrations because they're atoms, so nothing changes over here on the energy scale. And now I take the temperature from zero to a non-zero temperature, I'll use 298 in this case, from my partition functions for the molecule, I know how that changes, uh, and that raises the energy in this instance, and my atoms will increase their translational energy, their, sorry, translational enthalpy in this case, so they go up a bit too. So now I've got a delta H, right, what is my enthalpy difference at 298 Kelvin between my molecule and between my atoms. And I can also add an entropy correction, so minus 298 times the entropy for the molecule, minus 298 times the entropy for the atoms, and this will give me a delta G. That's the difference between my atoms and my molecules. So finally, I want to express the molecular enthalpy or free energy in the same way that an experimentalist would. And an experimentalist, of course, defines a heat of formation or a free energy of formation. That, too, is an enthalpy change. Almost all thermodynamics involves changes in functions. And the convention for formation heats or free energies is that it's the change relative to the elements in their most stable elemental form. So elemental standard states, in some sense, define the experimental convention. So the easiest thing for me to do is look up in a textbook somewhere what is the heat of formation at 298, for example, of an atom of carbon plus four times an atom of hydrogen. That is, I know the experimental heats of formation of those atoms. Thus, if I add my computed change in enthalpy relative to the atoms to the experimental value for the atoms, I will have a prediction of the heat of formation of my molecule. 
So I do need to add to the experimental, experimentally established heats of formation of the atoms. And I've done the computations because I want to know what's the difference between molecule and atoms. And that lets me get an estimate for the thermodynamic heat or free energy, what have you, of formation of the molecule. So I'm going to wrap up uh, this video where now that we know how to do a calculation to get a heat of formation, in the next video I'm going to talk about how do these theories do compared to experiment, compared to experimental heats of formation. But before I do that, I'll, I'll present you with one little intellectual puzzle to think about, and that is when we did semi-empirical theory, we talked a lot about how AM1 and PM3 and whatever predicted heats of formation. And I didn't say anything about doing frequency calculations. So I'd like you to think about uh, why is it that the semi-empirical levels predicted heat of formation? Or maybe more accurately, I should say, how is it? The why is pretty straightforward. That's because those data were available, and Dewar and uh, co-workers wanted to compare against available experimental data. But in order to make that comparison valid, what did they have to do to avoid doing frequency calculations? Right, I'll let you puzzle over that until the next video.